You're live. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Belmont Middle and High School Building Committee meeting number 161. Today is Thursday, June 22nd. It's 8.15 on this Thursday morning. Uh, my name is Bill Avalo. I chair the committee. And uh, thanks to Belmont Media and Jeff in the background, uh, we're coming to you uh, through a Zoom meeting. Uh, I will go through some procedures and then we'll start the meeting. At uh, mm -hmm. roll call, we'll establish a quorum and confirm the attendance. And then I'll ask people to keep their mics muted during uh, the time that you're not speaking so that others uh, won't be distracted with background noise. Uh, when we vote for committee members, please turn your mics on all at once so that we can move through the roll call voting pretty quickly. When people are speaking, I'll ask that you introduce yourself with your name so others that are listening can hear and understand who's speaking. Our committee members and consultants received uh, the material for today on Tuesday, two days ago, and the material will be posted on the Belmont Mill High School Building Committee uh, website following this meeting. Uh, for the public, there'll be a time for comment later in the meeting, and when that time occurs, you can raise your hand and the co-host will call on you. Uh, raising your hand is on your smartphone or computer, and if you don't have one, you're working uh, through a regular uh, phone, you can just press pound nine and co-host will be able to call on you. If at any time this audio gets interrupted, we'll suspend the meeting until which time uh, it is fixed. And with that, I'll start with roll call to uh, meeting for meeting attended. So Emma Thurston, good morning. Good morning. Patrice Garvin, good morning. Okay, John Phelan, good morning. Good morning. Pat Bruch, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Uh, I think Diane Miller said that she could not join us today. Actually, so Dave Blazon, good morning. Oh, I thought Dave was joining us. Okay, Tom Caputo, good morning. Good morning, Bill. You worried me there, Tom. Uh, Joel Mooney, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Uh, Kate Bowen said she'd be able to join us at nine o'clock, so we'll wait for her then. Uh, Jamie Shea is unable to join us today. Uh, Bob McLaughlin, good morning. Morning, Bill. Chris Messer, good morning. Good morning. Joe DiStefano, you there? Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Joe. Mike McAllister, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Amy Zuccarello, good morning. Amy? No? She just yeah. came on. She's on. Okay. She's logging on, Bill. Yep, she's there. She's on the mute. Okay. We'll wait for Amy to... Unmute herself. Good morning, Amy. And oh, my name is Bill Lavallo. Good morning. Ah, I'm uh, here. Okay, Amy. <laughs> Technology, wonderful thing. I know. Okay, I'm going to go through, uh, I'll, I'll come back and check on some of the other uh, committee members, but just for others, uh, is Jennifer Hewitt, our Belmont Finance Director, <laughs> joining us today? No, okay. Carla Coza, our District Reconfigured Transition Director, are you here today? Good morning. Good morning, Carla. Uh, Lisa Gibellario, our scribe. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Tom Gatsunas from CHA. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. Don White from CHA. Good morning, Don. Good morning, Bill. Uh, Sandra Saccone from CHA. Good morning. Okay, which I expect for you joining us. Uh, Justin Fredenze from CHA. Oh. Tony Del Greco from CHA. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Bill. Uh, from Perkins and Will. Uh, Brooke Trivis, you with us today? No, how about uh, from Perkins and Will, Vitale Albuquerque? I'm here, good morning. Good morning, Vitale. Uh, from Perkins and Will, Brian Spangler? Here, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Brian. Christine Mulligan from Perkins and Will, you with us? Hi, good morning, Bill. Good morning, Christina. Okay, uh, from Skanska, is Dan Leonardville here? Good morning. No, Jim Kraft, I think I saw you this morning from Skanska, good morning. Good morning. Uh, and then uh, Mike Morrison. Good morning. Yep. And uh, I guess we have a couple other people that uh, are joining us from Skanska. Jeff Firestein. Morning. Good morning, Jeff. And James Chung, are you with us? Good morning. From Skanska. Good morning, James. Okay. And then we'll go back and check here on a couple of committee members if they arrive late. Patrice Garvin. 
Uh, Dave Blazon. Okay, we do have a quorum, so that's good. I'll share the agenda. We should be seeing this now. First of all, I, I, it is my uh, my oversight uh, for Monday being the holiday, and I didn't get information to the town in time. Uh, so we scrambled Tuesday morning to make the 48-hour notice, and I appreciate people accommodating the 8.15 start. That is not a new time for us. So our next meeting is uh, on – our next business meeting right now is scheduled for July – it's a Thursday, July 20th at 8 a.m., virtual meeting. Um, Today, we're going to re review and approve meeting minutes. we got two meeting minutes to approve. Uh, we'll hear about our project management and oversight from our OPM uh, designer and construction manager. We'll talk about project schedule. We'll get an update on uh, costs. We'll discuss some pending changes. We'll review some pending change orders. And we'll hopefully approve uh, a prime contract change order for this month. Uh, we have a couple of moving vendor POs, purchase orders that we need to approve to keep the project going. Uh, we'll have an adjustment in designer services, an amendment that we would like to approve today. We'll pay some bills, um, several bills, 13, I think there are total. We'll get a construction update. Um, I put this in here, but uh, I don't think there's any content for our open meeting law complaint to discuss today, so I won't be discussing that. We'll hear from uh, Rep Belmont residents and any new business, and hopefully we'll conclude right around 10 o'clock. As I said, our next building committee meeting is Thursday, July 20th. And uh, if we schedule something before then, I'll let you know. Any questions on the agenda from committee members? Okay, hearing none, uh, our next uh, item on the agenda is approval of meeting minutes. And I will say that uh, last month we had this in front of committee members, but Bob McLaughlin wanted to take time to review uh, the meeting minutes from April 28th. Bob, I did not see any comments from you. Uh, do you have any further comments on these meeting minutes? No, no, we'll approve them unless somebody else has comments. Any other comments from committee members? Okay, we do have a, a motion for approval. Do we have a second then? Uh, second. Okay, all in favor, committee members, uh, please turn your mics on for approval of meeting minutes from April 28th. Emma Thurston? Yes. Okay, Patrice Garvin? John Phelan? Yes. Pat Bruch? Yes. Uh, Dave Blazon? Yes. Yes, you're here. Oh. Uh, Tom Caputo? Yes. Joel Mooney? Yes. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Abstain. Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zuccarello? Yes. Okay, Bill Lovallo, yes. Thank you. Uh, and here's our next set from our last meeting. That was May 18th. Thursday, May 18th. I did not receive any comments from anyone. Are there any uh, comments or edits proposed by committee members? Okay, Bob, not hearing any? Yeah. Hearing none, I approve, move approval meeting 160. Pat, okay. second. Okay, all in favor? Emma Thurston? Abstain. Uh, John Phelan? Yes. Pat Bruch? Yes. Dave Blazon? Yes. Tom Caputo? Yes. Joel Mooney? Yes. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Abstain. Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zuccarello? Yes. Bill Lovallo, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, if you're still seeing uh, the screen, we'll go to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, project management oversight by our OPM, our designer and our construction manager. And uh, I think that we can go through this pretty quickly, but I'll turn it over to, is this you, Don or Tom? Tony. Tony, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tony from CHA. Bill, no, can I just jump in for a second? Yes, certainly, Dave. You could clarify something. Um, I actually was not at the last meeting, so I need the vote of state in that uh, meeting minutes. I apologize. Thank you, Dave. That's why I write in pencil. Okay. Go ahead, Tony. All right. So uh, a lot of the activities are the same as they are, you know, from month to month. Uh, we, we, we've completed our uh, our uh, collaborating with Scansco on the summer work schedule. 
as we're, we're in summer slam of work right now, uh, running two shifts, uh, EV charging station coordination with Belmont light. And then there's some new out in the field, uh, the sports field grading, the, the, uh, the irrigation system installation, uh, they've, they've been planting trees on the phase two side as well as sod. So the soccer field is now all have grass in it. Um, everything else for oversight for, for site work is basically the same as it was last month. Okay. Any questions co from committee members? Bill, or can I just take the opportunity to say publicly that while the sod is down and looks great, people should not be walking on it. People should not be walking their dogs on it. Uh, kids should not be playing on it. Let's let the grass have a chance to grow for the benefit of the entire community um, for the future. Good point. That goes without saying that if you were doing that, you were crossing the construction fence, which is another big problem. So it's, it's on the other side of the construction fence. But yes. Okay. Uh, Perkins and Will update. This would be, I think, Brian. It is. Yep. Good morning again, everyone. This is Brian Spangler with Perkins and Will. Um, in addition to kind of our regular month to month um, activities, which are listed here, um, in the past month, we've also submitted our design final application for our lead certification. This is the second out of four submissions to the uh, U.S. Green Building Council who, who administers that program. Um, so that's a that's a great milestone. Um, We've also been uh, working with Skanska to develop an affidavit schedule, um, which was sent out to the team this past month. And um, our efforts are just increasingly focused on occupancy uh, for the start of the school year in the fall. And Brian, can you explain to people that are listening what you mean by affidavit policy or, or procedure and what sure. an affidavit actually is? Yeah. Sure. So, um, Anytime a new portion of the building is ready for occupancy, um, the building department in order to issue their certificate of occupancy um, requires us to submit an affidavit um, from ourselves and also all of our consultants, electrical, mechanical, um, and so on to um, uh, basically for record state that the building is safe and constructed to the best of our knowledge per design. Per the code. And so to get there, uh, and I think folks might remember this from, from prior um, TCO efforts, but to get there, we, we really work closely with Skanska communicating things that we see um, on site that need to be addressed. And those items could include accessibility issues, um, um, life safety systems issues um so uh you know we're there um we'll we'll, we'll be on site regularly as we always are um mm -hmm. two to four days a week um communicating with skanska on those items leading up to uh the middle of august thank you brian any questions from committee members okay so uh skanska i think this is you mike uh, yep. want to provide your uh, this would be more of your construction management oversight. Correct. Uh, most of these activities are similar to what you've seen. Our focus in May in particular was really on phase two punch list and preparing for the summer work we're currently underway with. I think the biggest, just to kind of piggyback on, on Brian's update, you know, when Brian and his team are doing affidavits, that triggered those dates and the targets for those affidavits triggers activities for us and our subcontractors to deliver to Brian and his team to be able to do those affidavits. So it's taking the checklist um, that's produced by Brian, making sure we have all of our ducks in a row and uh, a good work plan to achieve all of those milestones to then hand off to receive those affidavits. So that's a big piece of us closing out a project in general, uh, but with the phasing work in particular, it's a little challenging. We can't get to some of those things until some critical work is done. So it's really handoffs, uh, scheduling, not by week, but by shift. Uh, and that's a lot of what we've been doing in anticipation of the summer. So uh, really kind of zeroing in on shift by shift schedule for executing this work. And just to put all this in a package uh, for committee members and those that are listening outside the committee. Um, 
this project as we're winding down with phase two, so getting to substantial completion, uh, the building of a building uh, requires construction documents. That's what that's what uh, are being followed. That's what's being followed. Those consist of drawings, specifications, and uh, directives, called uh, construction directives. Uh, there are over a thousand drawings that were uh, bid at the beginning of the job. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think over six thousand pages of specifications. Mike, you probably have a better handle on that since you've been living in them. And um, and I think over 900 construction directives. If I'm not right uh, off too far. So there's a lot of all this information that gets that that when Brian says affidavits, it's a testing that all of that packaged together is what uh, the team is responsible for. So uh, a lot of information on the project. Any questions from committee members? Okay, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which is schedule. It's it's shrinking, Mike. It's shrinking. I guess that's a good thing. Shrinking uh, on this summary, but I, there's a lot behind the, the the curtains here. So this this is very similar to what we did, what we presented last month. Uh, for us, the the format of the schedule you're seeing here is really being replaced with a a, a shift by shift schedule that kind of feeds into this. So. Uh, while it's it's very few lines in the summary, we have uh, you know many 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 pages of detail of our roadmap to get to August fifteenth, and uh, you know no surprise it's the the stair demo and completion of the the life safety for the connection between phase one and phase two that's that's priority. So we're we're pushing through that. We're on schedule now, and um, you know ready for August 15th. I'm not sure if there's any other specific questions uh, on some of the other site activities because those are also progressing on the similar path to, uh, to, the, to what's going on in the building. And, and you, you know, substantial completion August 15th. And then uh, over here is a little, the, the PV system, right? We wanna have an update specific to that. We, we started, we'll have some updates and photos of that. Correct. Yeah, uh, you know, we're anticipating. People say, "When are you going to turn it on?" Well, there's not quite sure on that uh, magic date yet, but uh, we know that we're assembling and we're testing and we're certifying, and then we're working with Belmont Light. Looks like uh, through September right now to the beginning of October. I don't know if that October fourth is a date you're saying we could turn it on, but there are other people that have to weigh in on that. Correct. There's a there's a lot of work that kind of goes into that October 4th date. That's like you said, some of it's in our control. Some of it is working with other like the municipality for one. Uh, but we're, we're doing what we can now. The panels are on the roof. Uh, we're pulling feeders. We're prepping the electric room. We're preparing for shutdowns. So we're, uh, we're working towards the goal, uh, but that date may, you know, that date's a kind of a target for us at this moment. All right. So, Committee members, any questions on schedule? What was discussed? Bill, do you mind if I add one more thing to our list? I, I, I neglected to say that um, we also received this month the majority of the phase two furniture. Um, and I, I wanted to give a shout out to Christina on, on our team who uh, really organizes that whole effort. And she's on site receiving all of the deliveries and orchestrating uh, where they go in the building al alongside Sandra. Um, from CHA, that's that's a huge effort, and I'm sorry I neglected to mention that earlier. Yeah, from from both teams, uh, we'll have some photographs of that. But I think mo Brian, most of the furniture is in now, correct? I believe that's correct. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I so, think the statistic bill it was ninety six percent. So, Christina, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, sorry, and sorry, Christina Perkins Noel. Christine, and how was that in phase one? What, what, when would we get 95% or so of furniture in relative to the start of school? <laughs> Jokingly, the day before school? No. Um, it, it. It, it, yeah. it was a big push for, for phase one, of course, with, with COVID and all of that going on. But um, glad to say we're a couple months out and everything's here. So less stressful, of course. Right, right. I think we were borrowing furniture from here and there for things that were back ordered or weren't delivered. So... Uh, much better shape the start of the summer and we already have all the furniture in so or at least uh, for most part in the building probably still shaking it out any questions from committee members 
current schedule. Okay, we'll, we'll move right into the project cost uh, updates, but I wanna skip uh, on this in some chair. I'm going to move to something else. Um, as I said, we discussed the project cost updates. Typically, then we discuss pending changes from Perkins and Will, and then we, use pen we review pending change orders. I wanna jump to a pending, I wanna jump to an issue uh, that, uh, that came up in the last, well, that's been uh, building for a little while, but uh, I asked the team, and again, I'm not rendering a decision or opinion, but I asked the team to put together a potential change order that represents a potential risk or a risk out there regarding uh, the scope of the PV or the solar panels that will have a financial impact, potentially uh, also schedule impact on this project. Um, I'm going to ask CHA to present that now because it's tied into what we're projecting and we're, and we're gonna unpack that. Um, I got a lot of pushback when I asked this from the team because nothing's settled yet. So when we present this, um, Don will talk about what it means, but it's also, there's a lot of unknowns. But I felt that as chair uh, and Pat and I discussed this to a point to say, we need to inform the committee. Even though we don't know what it is, we need to inform the committee. <laughs> So when I said our next meeting is uh, middle of July for business, it's possible and I think it's likely that we need to meet within the next couple of weeks as soon as this team gets a better handle on what, what the impact might be to this project so we can discuss it further and make some decisions. This, Pat and I also, uh, we aren't deliberating, but we said it will not be on our shoulders to make this decision. It is a community uh, committee decision. So I'll put that there, uh, out there right now that we need uh, a committee to weigh in on this. So I'm gonna jump from this to, uh, to there it is. Yeah, PCO, number, PC, so private potential, potential change order 933. So Donna's, I think this falls in your court. Right, um, Don White from CHA. Um, we've been addressing this issue um, related to the PV scope over the last two months. Um, effectively, we've had trouble with the racking system um, and how it stays on the roof. The, the goal of the project and the specification was written that a ballasted rack system only uh, was the intent of the project. And what that means is the racks that sit on the roofing system, directly on the roofing system, um, and they the panels sit into these racks and it's either at a five degree or a 10 degree tilt. Um, the intent was to ballast these. And what that means is there are pans built into these racks that they put um, concrete masonry units, conventional concrete blocks, uh, typically four inches in thickness and two blocks per rack to hold the panel rack system down onto the roof so it doesn't blow off um, during a wind event. Um, we've been working as Skanska has been with um, their subcontractor Griffin Electric and they have a supplier uh, that provides the racks for the project and it was becoming effectively impossible to create a ballasted system only to hold the racks in the panels down onto the roof. Um, there are peculiarities with the wind in this building location, and it's, uh, I'll let others speak to that, but it's uh, the, the geometry of the building with lots of corners, uh, outside corners, create unique wind conditions that, um, the uplift on many of the racking panels uh, was exceeding the allowable value. And uh, we couldn't put any more ballast into these pans. Um, they can only hold so much. So plan B was, and it's what we've explored over the last uh, six weeks, it is still developing as Bill said, but we think we have a plan in place now, uh, is to mechanically fasten a certain number of the racks and panels to the roofing system. And exactly how we do that, we're 
looking at a couple of different options right now. Um, the goal had been to not do this, so that we would not penetrate the new roof membrane, uh, which is always somewhat of a compromise to the roofing system. And uh, But we reached a point where all the engineers looking at this could not come up with a solution to have a ballasted system only and that mechanical fasting was going to be required. So, and like I said, it's a, it's a relatively small quantity of the overall 2,400 panels uh, that are going to require mechanical fastening, but they're in the unique locations at the end of a, a wing of the building uh, where there are, the corners create uh, unique wind conditions and uplift uh, that we're going to have to be mechanically fastening some of these. So that is something that was not bought in the contract. Um, the reality is we're faced with we're going to have to do that in some cases, and we have a preliminary proposal from Skanska and Griffin um, for the cost to do this. And uh, the biggest cost uh, from Griffin is the first line item in the, the PCO, which is the $220,529 is, uh, is the mechanical fastening systems uh, based on the quantity of panels and racks that we see right now that are going to require this. Um, that's over, over 1,200 fasteners, uh, mechanical fasteners right now. Yep. And that was that was a high end, if I understand, of mechanical fasteners. Which is, yes, as we are looking at the other option of a 10 degree tilt panel, we will be, we could potentially reduce that quantity, have more of the racks that are um, stabilized with ballast as opposed to mechanical fastening. Mm -hmm. So um, the other related subs involved in this is um, the roofing subcontractor, Silktown. Um, whenever, wherever we penetrate the roof, we need a solution that uh, waterproofs those penetrations, and that would be Silktown's involvement. Don, let me just put a pause on this, right? You, yep. you talked about our preference was not to penetrate, but it's not that it isn't an industry standard to actually have mechanical fasteners. It was just our preference to avoid it. In fact, there's quite a product, uh, there's pro quite a product inventory out there of different solutions that that provide watertight connections for mechanical fasteners. Right, and and you know there are other, if you will, um, penetrations through the roof throughout the roofing system that you know are waterproofed, uh, flashed to uh, the standards today to make sure that they are watertight. It's just where there's an option to penetrate the roof or not penetrate the roof, it's always best to not penetrate the roof. But uh, we're dealing with that. We've got a system that we are working through that uh, should provide a, an acceptable solution at the end of the day. Um, we still have some details we're working out. We've got meetings today, tomorrow, next week to finalize these solutions, to uh, get the right racking system in place with the right quantity of panels and a solution to hold these panels down onto the roof that uh, is acceptable to everybody. So this is a big ticket item that we had not anticipated. Um, you know, we are at a preliminary value of $337,303. And this is preliminary until we work out all these details. Um, and as we go to looking at the uh, monthly financial report, it's obvious that this has eaten up the majority of the contingency uh, that was left at the uh, following meeting. Okay, so uh, thanks for that oversight. I might ask for Skanska to provide any input, but right now I see Bob McLaughlin's hand up. I'm sure we have quite a few questions. So Bob, uh, fire away. Uh, what? How many panels are we talking about that have to be fastened? What what percentage of the overall uh, uh, solar array is is involved? So, Mike, I'd ask you. We got uh, this is based on twelve hundred fasteners, and I didn't know how many fasteners is that per rack. Um, I can develop that in the next thirty seconds. I just rather. If we could take five minutes, I can get you the real number rather than well, uh, I, taking a stab at it. That's a prelude to my next question is, if it's not a tremendous amount, have we also considered as plan C, eliminating those panels? How much do we lose? I mean, we're looking at $337,000. And so we should look at the, uh, the, the, the 
the cost effectiveness of spending $337,000 if we're only losing 4 or 5% or even 10%. Of our solar panels, uh, it, it it may be a financial decision to just eliminate those panels. I suspected, Bob, that that's uh, something that the committee wanted to at least put out there as far as our due diligence for evaluating this issue. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's more than ten percent. <throat> Any other? There must be other questions from the committee members. <clears throat> so this this. This cost is really a first pass. As a matter of fact, uh, it says draft on here. I was going to take it off because we never have draft. But uh, in all fairness to Skanska, this is they, they pulled some numbers together without really um, fully having a solution. So, um, so I left draft on. Uh, let's ex Don take a little time to explain what you meant by ten degree and uh, five degree. Sure. The uh, the basis of design established by Solar Design Associates had a racking system uh, that tilts the PV panel on the rack five degrees off of uh, dead level, and that um, allows better exposure to the sun. Um, but with a five degree tilt rack and panel, the amount of ballast that we can put under the panels is limited because the, the five degree tilt only brings the panel up so high to allow um, a limited number of the concrete blocks I was talking about that go into the uh, the trays on the, the racking system. With a 10 degree tilt panel, which is what we're concentrating on right now, we've got a layout for that, we're trying to refine that. The, the tilt increases from 5% to 10%, which means the high end of the panel is higher and further <laughs> off the roof, which allows more room for ballast trays and concrete blocks to go into those trays. So what it provides us the opportunity to have uh, fewer mechanical fasteners and getting back to the original intent, to have a, a ballasted system um, for as many of these panels as we can. Now, that being said, we still know, even if we go to the 10 degree tilt system, um, we are still gonna have some mechanically fastened panels um, in the odd conditions I was talking about at the end of the wings and where we have high wind conditions. Well, because um, it, it speaks to what Bob was saying was, you know, but if, how do we reduce those fasteners? And this is one option, which is to add more ballast, tilt the panels more. There's an advantage to tilting the panels in one aspect, Bob, right, is that they have higher production rate. They, at 10 degrees, they have a, a greater exposure to the sun and they produce about 5%, four to 5% greater output per panel with the 10 degree tilt than with the five degree panel. So we, the, we, one of the drawbacks with five degree versus 10 degree to begin with is that uh, you generally need more space for a 10 degree tilt panel um, because when you're laying these panels out end to end, the fact that a 10 degree tilt panel is up higher off the roof casts the shadow to the next panel behind it. And so it has to be spaced a little bit further apart. So several variables are being studied right now. Uh, can't tell you when all this will be. Well, I've asked this question, but I didn't get an answer because I don't think it's that easy. When we'll have the the best solution in place that we can come back to the committee. So I'm going to ask the committee to be uh, to get a little patience here that uh, the team could do their due diligence. And as soon as the information is ready, I'm going to work to schedule a meeting just it would just basically be this topic to move forward you know get some direction so we can move forward because when i talked earlier about the october 4th and mike was kind of a little vague about it i mike was being kind this is this has an impact on that october 4th date we need to make a decision move that forward uh chris messer your hand is up yes um don you had mentioned in your uh review of the of what has happened here um 
you noted, you said we didn't buy it. Was this an option in the original scope and the original, um, I guess, the scope of work that we put out there? We could have bought, say, a thousand of these or 500 of these as part of the uh, conditions to install it, this. It's, it's possible the, you know, the, the goal, the intent, the hope had been to have a non mechanically fastened system throughout. This is not a tall building, it's three and four stories. Right. And the, the thought was that we would hope to not have the extreme wind conditions. But again, due to the geometry of this building, it's created some unique wind conditions that when the, uh, the rack company uh, runs their program on wind load analysis, it determines that there are panels in certain locations that just uh, um, ballast alone will not do the job. To answer Chris, Chris's question directly, our specs did not ask for a bid for a quantity of uh, anchorage, you know, uh, tie downs or hold downs. So had we done that, we, we would have been in a little better position. But as Bob, as uh, Don was saying, our expectation was we didn't need them. So we were buying fully ballasted solutions. Yeah. Um, Caputo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, it sounds like you're exploring a variety of different options, um, but maybe just to understand a little bit more, the 5% versus 10%, which I understand has trade-offs. Can we do a portion of the roof at 5% and a portion at 10%, or does it all have to, one consistent choice across the whole roof? We we have a layout now that we're studying, Tom, that is based on all 10%. And... Um, the thought is if we can get to a similar quantity of panels as we started with the five degree tilt, that would be our goal. Now, the, the other offsetting factor is if we have a slightly lesser quantity of panels at 10 degree than what we had at five degree, that is somewhat offset by the increased output of four to 5% per panel at 10 degrees versus five degrees. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're looking at this, but it does sound like there's probably some optimization of, you know, panel tilt in certain areas, mechanical fastening in certain areas, you know, optimized layout. I'm sure that's the work that still has to happen, but um, it, it may be a lot of pieces sort of come together I, here that creates a, a solution I, I, that sort of works. Just agreeing with you. I, I think the, the goal, if we can get to a layout uh, with 10 degrees that produces what we were looking for in the five degree tilt, we'd be better off with the same rack throughout the project uh, consistently. Okay. We can explore the possibility of some a combination of five and 10%, but I, I think the desire would be to stick with a single rack uh, system for layout and installation purposes. And to be okay. clear, what, what we're looking for, we keep going back to our design team, SBA, is an understanding of how it compares an output back to the original basis of design, not necessarily quantity of panels, but output. As, as Don said, there's variations per panel depending on how they're oriented and also how they're shaded, right, uh, where they're placed and so forth. So uh, there's, there was a statement, you know, we can put all the panels back up, but if they're in the basement, they're not doing anything. Yeah. So basically, they have to be in a good production area to be um, exceeding or at least meeting our expectations as far as production. So, um, so it's not just counting panels on the roof, but actually understanding how they will produce energy. So uh, it's back and forth between the construction group and the design analysis group, because the construction group does not analyze um, production rate. That's not what they do. So that's why we have SDA uh, helping us on that side. I feel comfortable that we decided to go down the path having SDA working for the owner, work for Belmont, because I feel that if and when this issue had come up, if we put everything in the contractor side, not to say they would be um, doing anything wrong, but you never understand exactly what the perspective is from one side. So we have a back and forth and I think it's very healthy for the project. It just takes time. And I'm hopeful that within 
two weeks, all of this will be settled down and we'll have a path forward. So I can't schedule a meeting now because I don't have a date. I, I actually didn't uh, ask uh, Skanska, Mike Morrison's been in the middle of all this. Do you have anything more to add, Mike, regarding what Don said? No, I was going to clarify some things, but Don nailed it in the future. Well, you know, essentially what I wanted to say is that the, the option to go to 10 degree tilt, it really, it has to be by array. They're one big system. All these panels are kind of tied together. So the options of fine tuning are kind of limited. We can't pick this one panel that has an attachment and change that one panel to 10 degree because they all kind of work together as a system. So it's that whole system would have to change to 10 degree, which means the spacing would have to change. So it's, um, we, we've been doing a lot of the analysis this group has been talking about to try to fine tune this plan. Uh, so I think, I think that's a lot of that's been said. So unless I have, I can answer any questions they might have, but. Um, so, you know, we don't, we have quite a few other things to prove today to talk about. So I want to move back. This is important. Um, I suspect that I'll be reaching out to the committee to schedule a meeting in about two weeks work around the holiday, but it's important. Keep in mind that uh, this has to be approved. I want to add one more thing. And so that October 4th date is, mm -hmm. is out there, but we also received, might as well uh, talk about this now really quickly. We received notice from Belmont Light about uh, two months ago as well, that the infrastructure is not entirely ready to receive uh, our PV system and that we need to make changes to protect the Belmont side of uh, the network, uh, we brought to the committee a, a, a switch, SDL switch, and and uh, that's an additional one. We already had one in room, so we're putting another one in to help uh, this uh, relay condition that we need to add. We don't know when that switch is coming in. We can't turn this on. We can't interconnect this to the network or the grid <clears throat> light until we have the switch. We also have to put in another uh, few components on the transformer. Belmont Light is doing that. And again, uh, we have to get those components in hand and we're still waiting on the schedule for that. So there are other pieces on the other side, not just the racking that have to get in place. Um, and that schedule, uh, we don't know that yet either. So it's in our budget. We've, we've talked about it a little uh, earlier, but what we haven't talked about is we still don't know when all that will be ready. So, uh, and it requires a building shutdown. So you can imagine if we're past uh, August 15th, now we have to work with the school department to figure out when we could shut the building down electrically to put these in. Likely it'll be a weekend and I think that we could find the right time for that, but uh, we'll just have to work that out when we get the date. Bob McLaughlin, your hands up. Yeah, very briefly, and I'm not an engineer, but they, uh, there are some amazing adhesives these days. As you explode the possibility of essentially gluing them down with one of these <laughs> super adhesives. Got it, um, so that's plan C. Well, we are. <laughs> it, could be plan, it could be plan B very soon when we do some testing. Yeah. No, we, we are looking at that. Uh, we're, we're looking at all the fastening system opportunities. Um, and if, if that is a realistic solution, given the uplift on a, any particular panel, uh, that might be the better way to go. So it, it is part of the analysis that we are doing. And if yeah. there are limitations on that, uh, we may have a combination of anchors as well. Yeah, I mean, adhesive underneath the existing Correct. roof. That's, that's true, Dave. We, we, have, we are analyzing the entire system the entire bond of the roofing system to the concrete, to the insulation, to the membrane. So it's it's all part of that analysis. And then we'll have some proof tests, whatever anchorage system we have will be tested uh, before we put in a production. So all these pieces are, are in play. Uh, it's, uh, it's all unfolding as we speak. Okay. Um, Bob, I think uh, you don't have your hand up anymore. So Don, we'll jump back to the projects update. And I think financially, if you, this number, I'll just remind you that we just talked about, and I'm just looking for my cursor. Here we go. Uh, was put into our system at 337,000, which is essentially about the change on this. Uh, yeah, that um, effectively ate up all of the contingency we had uh, at, at the end of last month's meeting. I'm just doing um, it here. Yeah. So, you know, the same format as what we've been doing is um, 
Let me go to the top at first, just so we can see the headers, Bill. Um, so, uh, you know, what we concentrate on is uh, fourth column over the current projected final cost um, by category to compare that to the first column, the MSBA approved line item uh, amounts. And most of these forecasts have held true over the last couple of months. We continue to look at these to see if there's any opportunity on uh, reducing the projected cost, but uh, we're pretty much the same as we were last month, except when we get to the construction line items, which includes the uh, PCO, the PCO that we were just, uh, just discussing. So uh, a little further down, um, Okay, I guess to the next page, Bill, we're gonna go. <clears throat> yep, okay, so the um, the current exposure forecast for um, final construction cost is the 257,155,239. Uh, and that is inclusive of all the additional cost to the project, it's all the uh, the, the original GMP, the change orders approved to date, the additional potential costs that we've been looking at, and we'll show that on the subsequent sheets. But this is the biggest major change from last month, and that's because it includes the cost for the uh, attachments for the racking system. Okay, so we'll just go through the summary then. Update. Yep. So um, as we've done last couple of months, um, I adjusted the uh, total project funding to start with the MSBA approved amount of 295, 159, 189, and added in the supplemental funding uh, that became available to the project, which is the COVID CARES Act, the COVID ARPA funds, uh, the additional funding that was uh, funded out of ARPA for the um, allowance, uh, the alternate number two for the um, PV panels, which allowed us to put the panels on the F-wing that were originally excluded and a small rebate on the builder's risk insurance. So that takes the, the total available funding, uh, factoring all that into 296, 817, 613. And, uh, Fourth column over, which is what we've been just talking about and concentrating on, is the projected cost. Uh, everything in uh, other way, Bill. There you go. Uh, it's two hundred ninety-six million eight thirteen five thirteen. That shows um, a small amount of contingency left of four thousand one hundred and twenty-six dollars. So um, it's a Big hit from where we were last month, where we are exploring the options to reduce that cost if that is possible. Um, but that is where we sit today. So if you remember where we were, I'm just gonna pull this up for committee members. Yep. We were uh, hovering around 350. And that's yep, where we 346 to be. last month. Yep. And if you take the 337 out of that, that's essentially the chunk that you have left here's 4,000 plus or minus yep. 2,000. So, um, so we're at a challenge right now, and, and certainly uh, we need the team to continue to work and squeeze and find solutions that are more cost effective for Belmont. Uh, just a quick update back to this page, Don. We, we, uh, we have reimbursements from MSBA totaling 68.5 million roughly. Yeah, that's through, uh, I guess it's propane number 60. We got that information updated. So they will be stopping the propay at about 95%. And uh, that I think is 95% of the 80, which is somewhere around 76, 75, 76. So we still have uh, propay com money coming in for several months than I, I could presume. Correct. Yeah. We are at uh, 95, almost 96% of our original initial taxpayer burden. And um, the total project complete is a little over 96%. So, um, so we're tracking pretty close here. Yep. That's on total construction cost value. Yep. Any questions from committee members? 
Uh, the rest is backup. I don't think we'll spend much time on it. So all the backup is what feeds into this <laughs> couple of pages of summary. Other than the big issue we talked about, uh, the team has been doing well tracking changes. We're uh, well into the demo. We're going to hear about that. That's there. All, all the, the unknown, unknown potential uh, summary. Uh, we'll talk about that next month, but uh, we should have all the unknowns really well uncovered uh, in the next couple of weeks. We'll get into that a little further down. So if there are no questions or comments, we'll go on to uh, some potential pending changes that are out there, or at least pricing options. And quickly, Brian, is this you or Vital? Uh, sure. Yep, this can be me. Um, so as I mentioned, every month, um, this, this list, um, we have some flows with things that come up uh, mostly on site unexpectedly at this point. Um, so uh, I typically don't go through any of these individually, but if anyone has a question, um, happy to elaborate if needed. Yeah, really high level. We, we're uh, reviewing the kiln exhaust and connection for, um, in the art room. And there may be a potential coordination with the four inch exhaust duct. Uh, Art room sliding panel wall uh, doors. Uh, I think we're adding some small pulls on those, so a little architectural item, but it's going to make it uh, more effective to move them. Uh, we have a little bump out in one of our partitions, right, to get the proper space for uh, uh, a handicap stall. And then finally, down here, we we did recognize that the, some of the dispensers for uh, toilet paper were. In, in the handicap stalls were too far away from the, uh, the toilet and they're gonna be mounted a little closer. So this one is small things, which is good. Other than the big one we talked about earlier. Any questions? Any members? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah Bob, go ahead. Bill, I mean, so we got $400 left for contingencies. Are, are these three items going to eat up that $400 or are these somehow in an allowance? Uh, we're still waiting for pricing. I would say, honestly, uh, I think we'll have more than 4000 but these potentially uh, added up would be more than four. These are pricing, by the way. We, we have to still make decisions, but uh, I suppose they will crest $5,000, $4,000 if you add them all up. Then shouldn't we also at this juncture be thinking about what can we save some money between now and the end of this project uh, by cutting something out that is, isn't as essential as these things that we are eating up our contingencies? All, all worthy of uh, a discussion, yes. I mean, this these haven't been issued yet, uh, but they're- no, I know. But... Yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, the art room sliding panels, poles are very small issue. I mean, we, uh, yeah. Just to be tall, Kirk, Kirk, so well, just to add a little detail, maybe Mike could we want to be specific with these. I think a couple of these already have some exposure line items in the uh, in the exposure log for the uh, art room poles and the uh, the stall on the first floor, which I think is going to zero because it's kind of four in another PCO. So specific to these, there's some uh, already uh, in the exposure log. Good point. Okay. So we're always watching this, Bob. We're up being transparent regarding, you know, just what the team is working on. When they're priced, it's a price to make a decision, right? That's why they're PRs. If they're CCD, you have to make that. And both of these 480 and 42 are code related. And as Vitel said, at least one of these, I think this one up here, Ambitory, that's, that's captured somewhere in our budget already. Matter of fact, I think this solution is less than the budget, right? It's all that we had captured earlier. Yeah, it's actually captured in PCO that's being uh, reviewed today. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's move on to those then. This will be Tony. These are uh, three. We've already talked about one, so there'll be two potential change. PCO nine thirteen is related to an RFI eighteen fifty. Uh, it provided direction to install three marker boards uh, in the F wing on floors two and three, three rooms. 
So this is the place to install those three boards. And this is not a nice to have. This is just a right. need to have in those classrooms. Yep. Uh, PCO 924. Uh, you know, just again, and the cost, the, the potential cost here is 8,150. Yep. Uh, so PCO 924 is to add uh, wall switch protection in the field house and small gym. Uh, there were several switches uh, that, that were protruding from the CMU wall uh, that, that kind of required some protection. Uh, it was re both required in and requested uh, by facilities. Uh, one student uh, suffered a, a very, very minor injury and, and cut himself on the edge of one of those, the panels uh, of those switches. So it was decided that we were going to enclose all of the switches within the field house, uh, either in uh, plastic covers that you would typically see over like a thermostat. And then there was a custom one that had to go over where the uh, the big fans are, are located. There's the switches for those and and other devices within the field house. And that was custom built by Skanska Carpenters. Okay, and that cost is, total cost is $5,000. Those are done. This is actually all work that's complete. And uh, I think Dave is, is satisfied with it, I hope. So uh, any questions for committee members on these are not approved. These are not being, these are under review right now. So they're not coming to committee for approval. However, well, we talked about this. And so, however, we'll move then on to a change order, prime contract change order number 53 that is coming to us for approval. There are uh, 28 items here. Um, several of them are zeros. Some of them are negative. I think this is actually uh, uh, an, an odd change order and that it actually is giving credit back to the project, but these are project uh, changes that were worked on for quite some time. Some decisions committee members made as a committee we made a while ago that are now uh, ready for approval. And I'll ask Brian to go through probably about eight of them, but probably around the 5,000 or higher. Bill, just as before Brian starts as we tell again, I uh, just want to reiterate and maybe anticipating maybe Bob's question. Uh, <laughs> previous in this one, but the the PCOs that were are still in review that you just mentioned or re reviewing are also on the exposure log. They're already accounted for, even though they haven't been approved yet, and we're still reviewing the cost and all that. And uh, everything on this list, obviously, is also already on there. So these are already accounted for in the overall. Right. Everything we presented today is accounted for in some form or fashion. The only thing that's not are the pending changes and those, have, you know, they're also being priced for a decision. Okay, Brian. Okay, um, I'll start with PCO 905. Um, the cost in this PCO is to provide uh, a precast concrete block and boulder protection, uh, vehicular protection for the emergency generator. Um, in lieu of the screen wall that we had uh, originally documented and just wanted to note that um, the cost here is offset by um, an $80,000 credit we received for the original design for that screen wall um, that was previously approved in PCCO 35. Um, moving down to PCO 897, this is a credit of a little over $220,000. This credit came out of several landscape and site-related revisions. Uh, some of those revisions included um, an additional planning screen uh, for two above-ground switchgear locations um, at each of the main entrances to the campus off of Hittinger and Concord Ave. Uh, we reduced um, the height of some sports netting or the phase two baseball and softball fields. We removed a masonry wall um, base detail for the backstops for baseball, softball, and we substituted um, uh, asphalt, uh, excuse me, we substituted concrete for asphalt on some of the walkways. And all of these changes had been previously approved um, and reviewed um, by, the, by the committee um, uh, last year. Moving down to 915R1, this is another credit of around $5,600. Um, 
This was a reduction of some area drains in the practice basketball courts that are kind of between um, the, one of the new middle school wings and the field house. Uh, the, the drainage just wasn't, wasn't required there to the extent that was originally shown. Moving down to PCO 903, uh, the cost here covers the installation of a new scoreboard for the softball field and the associated uh, third-party engineering required for the foundations for the board. Um, the contract documents originally called for the salvage and reuse of the scoreboard that's currently installed at the playing field west of Harris Field. Um, that scoreboard will remain. And so, um, again, the cost here is just for the installation labor and the third-party engineering required for the foundations. The cost for the scoreboard itself is actually captured a little bit lower here in, in this PCCO. Hey, Brian, related to that, because I, I spent a lot of time on this um, last week, the, the biggest piece of this is the new structural steel framing systems for both the softball scoreboard and the baseball scoreboard. They're fairly elaborate, and uh, that, that is probably the biggest cost within this. Thanks, Don. Uh, moving down to PCO 854. <clears throat> um, this PCO reflects escalation cost in uh, PV materials that occurred between the original PV bid, which was in October of 22, uh, to when alternate number two was accepted in January of this year. Um, PCO 885 R4 uh, cost here is to modify the depth of uh, the, what they call alternate ambulatory stalls, um, which are accessible stalls that are a variation of the larger standard stall accessible stall. Um, and this came out of further, further review of discrepancies actually between the federal and state accessibility requirements. Um, so this affects six stall locations um, and the cost here also includes, uh, excuse me, it does not include modifications to the wall tile and wall finish um, that may come out out may come as a result of this revision. Those will be tracked separately on a time and materials basis if needed. <clears throat> PCO 904R1, which is a credit of around $130,000. Um, the credit here is, reflects the removal and decommissioning of ground well scope that was originally allocated as the supply source for the irrigation system. Um, when the first of two scheduled wells were dug um, on the phase two side, the well yielded a very, very low amount of water. Uh, so the decision was made to instead feed, feed the entire irrigation system off of the municipal water supply. So there's within this $130,000 net credit, there's an ad actually to um, decommission the well, that the well that was dug. Um, and there's a credit for obviously not having to dig the second well and also some electrical scope that um, wasn't required to be installed. Uh, PCO 882R1 cost here is to procure a new scoreboard for the softball field, as I noted earlier. Um, again, the documents originally called for the salvage and reuse of the scoreboard that's uh, west of Harris Field. Um, and so this cost here is just to procure the scoreboard itself. Uh, PCO 889R1, uh, this is a credit of around $106,000. Um, and this is the credit for uh, which the committee has previously reviewed and approved. It's a credit for the removal of several uh, wall graphics in the middle school. And yeah, that round, rounds out the list for items either in the 5,000 plus or minus direction. And as always, happy to answer any questions about any of the others. So are there questions for committee members? The total here uh, is actually a credit back to the project of $331,503. I see no hands, then uh, at this time, I'd entertain a motion to approve prime contract change order number 53 and the amount of a 
credit of three hundred thirty-one thousand five hundred three dollars. So moved, Bob McLaughlin. Had second. Okay. All in favor, committee members. Emma Thurston. Yes. Uh, Patrice. Okay. Uh, John Phelan. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Pat Bruch. Yes. Dave Blazon. Yes. Tom Caputo. Yes. Joel Mooney. Joel. Okay, I think Joel said he had a run. That's right. Uh, Kate Bowen. Bowen, I. Okay. Uh, Bob McLaughlin. Yes. Chris Messer. Yes. Joe DiStefano. Approved. Mike McAllister. Yes. Amy Zaccarello. Yes. And Bill Lavallo, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is uh, the two items here in this. We're, we're getting into the move, actually. I think some of it's in past tense and some of it's in within a few weeks. And Sandra will walk us through that. And uh, just Sandra, please uh, maybe start. You're here, right, Sandra, by the way? I am, yes. Okay. Hello. So Hello. Uh, maybe you can, before we get into the change, just kind of really quick uh, an overview of what is going on with the move this summer, what happened already. Okay, um, so we have had um, a move already happened that was uh, took place last week. It was an internal BHS move for folks that had been moved in previously to the phase one area who are now being relocated to their permanent homes on the phase two side. Uh, Sterling is was the company that we actually had uh, performing that move. They had a move that hit, they had also taken care of last summer was part of the splice moves that we had. And there was a remaining balance in their original PO. So we were gonna have, so we um, enlisted them to provide this particular PO, this particular move for the internal moves uh, prior to the bigger Chenery move. Um, as a result of the, the balance that was left on their previous PO, which was just under six thousand uh, dollars, we did walk them through. I did do a walkthrough with with Sterling for the the internal move uh, that just took place last week, um, and they and I asked them for a proposal, and this is the proposal that they provided. Uh, it was a few thousand dollars more than what was remaining in their previous PO. Uh, so what we're asking for is to, um, we will need to increase their existing PO or have a new PO uh, for the total amount of $2,723 uh, to make up the difference for what's remaining in their previous PO to what the new proposal is uh, for the move that took place last week. Um, so that move did take place. It was successful. It was a lot of work. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of furniture that was being moved. They earned every penny of their $8,000 here. Um, and, you know, we were down to the wire in terms of moving some of the largest rooms with the heaviest furniture um, and also the most crates and materials because we were moving all of the art spaces. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm glad that we've had a remaining balance from a previous move where they were extremely efficient and we had monies left over. So this move would be just an increase of $2,700 versus the 8,000 that you're seeing here. So we'll take a pause here. This we, we need a motion and approval because this is a purchase order modification or change to a current purchase order in the amount of $2,723.64. Bob, uh, you have a question first, go yeah, ahead. I, I just wanna understand where we are. It is illegal for us to vote to approve something that is beyond the amount of funds that we have to pay for. No, it, this, this is already, Budgeted. This is not okay. going to change it. Yeah. All right. All no. right. That, that should be made clear. All okay. right. I, I move approval. Add second. Okay. Uh, committee member. And again, what we're presenting, and Vital said this earlier, these numbers are in our, our budget summary uh, today. So uh, backing up, uh, Sandra started with what happened, and then we have another one coming up, but this is a change order. It's been a, a, a purchase, I should say. It's a uh, Purchase order change in the amount of two thousand seven hundred twenty-three dollars and sixty-four cents. Bob made a motion. Pat uh, seconded it. So all in favor? Emma Thurston. Yes. John Phelan. Yes. Pat Bruch. Yes. Dave Blazon. Yes. Tom Caputo. Yes. Kate Bowen. Bowen, I. Bob McLaughlin. Yes. Chris Messer. <clears throat> yes. Joe DiStefano. Yes. Mike McAllister. Yes. Amy Zaccarello. Yes. Bill Lovallo, yes. Okay. 
So Sandra, and, and back up, we, we already, for moving, we, are, we also brought on containers before the end of school to go over and help, you know, to be dropped off mm -hmm. to, for teachers to pack before they left. So that was yeah. part of the, we, we've already approved that in a prior, I think it was last month's fully committee yes. member. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. For restream. Yeah. For all the materials, the moving supplies that are needed, crates and bins. So there's a there's a lot of those now over at Chenery. I'll fill them. I'm I'm presuming, right? Ready to yes, go? Yes, you are. <laughs> so now this is your part two. Go ahead. So part two is the larger move for the Chenery Middle School, grades seven and eight, to be moved over to the Belmont New Belmont Middle School. Um, that move is scheduled to take place July 10th through July 12th. Uh, we did do a walkthrough with several movers that we solicited quotes from. Uh, the companies are Sterling, Michaels Movers, and then Wakefield Moving and Storage. Two of the companies we've worked for uh, have worked for us prior on this project, Sterling and Wakefield. Wakefield had done the larger first phase one move. Uh, they were excellent. Um, and but we put out for quotes and the result of those quotes is here. We received a quote. And just to let you know, the quotes that we're receiving are time and materials, meaning that even though we're saying that the, we're allotting July 10th through July 12th for this move, um, if for whatever reason folks are really efficient and they can get this move done in one day or two days, we only get charged for that one or two days. Um, and that will depend on if there's also, if there are added materials uh, in the move that were not um, understood at the time they put their quotes together, that could also be added in as well. So just to let you know, these numbers, these numbers are not fixed lump sums. These are based on time and materials and their best estimation. I can tell you right now that Sterling and Wakefield have, have risen to the occasion, have either come in under at certain times with their previous moves or have been able to just settle for the for what they quoted, even though they did a tremendous amount more. And that would be Wakefield in phase one, had done more than what they had quoted and still stuck to their original number. Um, so Michaels is the one company that I'm not familiar with. They do do, I do see their trucks a lot in the Cambridge area. They say they work a lot for Harvard and for MIT. Um, and they do a lot of also high-end residential moves. They're, Quotes were was a little bit different than what we received from Sterling and Wakefield, different format. I think they're used to doing different types of projects. Um, and as you can see, their number is much lower than Sterling and Wakefield because they are allotting a much smaller crew size and also uh, a, to only two days instead of three days. Um, for this move, I also asked for an alternate number um, if the movers were to be expected to move materials from third floor of Chenery down to the first floor, meaning we would have to use the elevator in both locations, both at Chenery to move materials down onto the trucks. And then you, of course, we're gonna be using the elevator when we get to the Belmont Middle School. Um, and so I asked for, if we had to relocate things from the third floor to the first floor in Chenery, I need an alternate price for what that would be. And the one company that did not provide that alternate price was Michaels. Um, and they also did not provide me with a price that if they exceed the two days, you know, what would that cost be if they, we needed them to come back with a truck for another day? Um, they kind of said verbally that, you know, we would honor, you know, the 399 an hour that we would charge. And that's overall, that's not just an hourly rate that I'm saying for the crew, but overall rate. Um, but we don't have that in writing. So that's where I consider them a risk. Uh, and, uh, in, in because they didn't provide the alternate quote that I consider that their quote almost incomplete, but that's to be, so my rec the recommendation from CHA is for Sterling who comes in with a number of $23,673. Um, they've laid it out for a three day move. Uh, again, this is time and materials. If they can complete this move in two days, they would only charge for the two days. Uh, this is just assuming the you know, worst case scenario, what maximum they think they would need is the 23,673. And again, we have also Wakefield had done the same. Wakefield's number is higher probably because they realize, they remember what happened in phase one where they ended up moving a lot more. Uh, so they're just protecting themselves a little bit here. But the difference is an enormous difference, I think, between the phase one move and this move that we're doing now with Chenery, just because we're not moving a lot of... Um, we're not moving to a lot of different locations temporarily, and we're also not moving in, um, furniture at all. So it's much more straightforward. Uh, so hopefully, you know, either Sterling or Wakefield would be able to come in well under their number that's quoted. That's Questions for committee calls. members, you know, and certainly, uh, you know, there's a big difference between Sterling and Michaels, but I see your rationale and, um, 
you know, sometimes you could just say the, the, the bids are non-responsive, even though he gave you a number because they're just really not paying attention. So uh, mm -hmm. Superintendent Phelan has his hand up. Uh, Bill and committee, I, I'd just like to thank Sandra for her work on um, this part of the process. It's been a, uh, a tremendous amount of coordination. So thank you, Sandra. And I also want to thank um, Gene O'Brien, the custodian at the Chenery, uh, Dave Blazin, who works with Gene to help support this work internally to get it ready to go to make it more efficient. Uh, Principal Nicolette Fondas has done a tremendous job getting her staff together and moving the work. And, uh, and really all of this coordination on the school side has been done through Carla Kosa's uh, leadership and effort, which I truly appreciate and, and just want to acknowledge to the group. This has been a lot of work behind the scenes and we deeply appreciate all the efforts of everybody just mentioned. Thank you, John. I, I second that. By the way, this started last year, right? Late last year, Carla, you know, Sandra and Carla starting to think about how this is going to happen, messaging to the teachers and, and others, staff. And uh, I think people really pulled up at the end of the year and, and got things done. So when, when Sandra said was removing July 10th and 12th, that stuff is ready to go now. So, okay, Bob McLaughlin has his hand up. I, I understand the uh, elimination of the risk, uh, and all the risk involved with Michaels for the reasons that you stated, but the $17,000 different there. How quickly do we have to decide this? If we have to decide it today, then I go with the recommendation. If there's some ability to go back to Michael's and get a, okay, that's your bid, but will you give us an upside no matter what? If it comes in less than twenty-three thousand dollars, and then we've saved money. So uh, I'm just concerned with with seventeen thousand dollars. What's our justification for not taking the lowest bid? Okay, so I did I did reach out to Michael's and did do a descope and ask them for a number for an extra day with a truck. Um, I let them know that anything that they had agreed to, they need to put in writing. They added a single sentence that they would, uh, in writing in an email, that they would honor their quote uh, for, the, for the items that were listed in terms of being moved, and, and they would add some shrink wrap. They would add a few things that I also said they didn't include any materials either, and typically you need some materials. When the movers come, they need to shrink wrap things. They may need some extra bins. Uh, they didn't provide any number for that as well. So they did provide, say that they would provide 10 extra items plus free shrink wrap and they would it, they would hold to their 6,000 number. And that's one of the reasons I, I said, I leave whatever you're, you're offering in writing. If you're saying you can, you are willing to say you could work another day um, if, if needed, and this is what the bottom line would be, uh, that would be, you know, that, that would work for us, but I need to have something that shows that you are you would honor, you know, if, you, if it took another day, I need to know what that cost would be, but they did not provide that in writing. All right, uh, I, I'm, I'm satisfied. I'll okay. go with the recommendation. But, and, and in answer to your question, Bob, this is July 10th, this is happening. They need to be, we need to confirm with a PO right. so they, we could get on their schedule. I think they've been kind to hold this. I think mm -hmm. Sandra said we're voting today to them. Um, but I, I do think that uh, if we delay this, we're going to be missing a date potentially. Mm -hmm. Too much risk. Movers are busy in the summer. Sandra finds out. Yeah, it's very. <laughs> Sandra, you know, I just joke, but Sandra told me she moved, I don't know, nine or 90 times in her life. I think after this nine. project, she probably won't move again. <laughs> but okay. Uh, so there's uh, there's a motion, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, there's not a motion yet, but we would need a motion to approve uh, the recommendation made by CHA for retaining Sterling to move the middle, the Chenery Middle School to the new high school, uh, the new high school, Belmont Middle and High School for a total of twenty three thousand six hundred seventy three dollars. So moved, Bob McLaughlin. Add second. Okay, all in favor, Emma Thurston. Yes. John Phelan. Yes. Pat Bruch. Yes. Dave Blazon. Yes. Uh, Tom Caputo? Yes. Kate Bowen? Bowen, I. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Yes. Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zuccarello? Yes. And Bill Lovallo? Yes. Thank you. And again, thank you uh, to all those, Sandra, uh, Carla, and all the folks that are helping make this happen so smoothly. So. Uh, we have one more change, uh, which is called amendment number 17 for Perkins and Will. Uh, I let uh, Don explain this just in summary. This is also a credit, uh, but it, it's something we've been tracking for a while. The reason for this approval today is the accounting department 
Belmont's accounting department encumbers monies, right? And they encumber based on votes. Even though we've made adjustments, we have to send back to them uh, negative adjustments as a vote and approval so that they can unencumber this or it's still money that uh, is tied up and it, it runs into end of project budget issues. So that's the reason for this quick update. Uh, Don White, CHA. So we got, I've been reviewing this with uh, Perkins and Will and uh, basically the biggest part of this is um, a reduction in cost to the monitoring of the hazardous materials um, from where we started at a, a budget of 275,000, where is it? I am trying to find, there it is there right here. Yeah. At uh, 275,000 to begin with uh, as a consultant to Perkins and Will, um, the, the final value um, billed is 86,945, less than what the budgeted amount was. So uh, we're taking that back as a credit um, there was some additional printing cost added early on in the project to Perkins and Will's budget, and uh, we've um, not expended the the majority of those dollar amounts. So we've got thirty six thousand and change coming back, and um, a couple of other smaller line items. Uh, well testing um, was build on a time and material basis and came in less than the budget of 84700 resulting in a credit of $6,908. And I, I don't know how this one came about, but we have a small credit of uh, topsoil testing of $97.57. So we'll take it. That totals at the bottom a credit of uh, $137,477. And at this point, I'd like motion to approve that so we can get this over to the town accountant and unencumber this money. We'll have to approve credits, so moved. Add second. And, and um, Bob, just to make this clear again, this is already into, this is not, this is already in the summary of a budget that we have yep. for the total project, yeah. Okay, yeah. all in favor, Emma Thurston. Yes. John Phelan. Yes. Pat Bruch. Yes. Dave Blazon. Yes. Tom Caputo. Yes. Kate Bowen. Paul and I. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Yes. Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zuccarello? Yes. And Bill Lavallo, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which is a, uh, which is a treasurer's update. We're going to pay some bills. I think there's 13 in total. Michael McAllister, are you ready to go? Yep. Thank you, Bill. As we do every month, we will vote our invoices by group uh, in three different big buckets. So I'll read each section. I'll give an opportunity for Bill and others to provide some specifics, and then we'll take a group vote at the end. So bucket number one has eight total invoices paid. Uh, I was going to start with the with the yellow ones there, Bill. An invoice paid to Hubtech, Hubtech excuse me, regarding invoice number 23-17380 in the amount of $47,685.71. Dated February 28th, 23, regarding PO 2300493. And this is for the phase two IT uh, for computer equipment. Uh, another invoice to be paid to HubTech regarding invoice 23-18683 in the amount of $92,107.05, dated 5-30-2023 regarding PO 2300493. Again, this is also phase two IT equipment from HubTech. Uh, third one in that bucket is an invoice paid to LCN regarding invoice 46489 in the amount of $29,300 dated uh, June 12th, 23, regarding PO number 2191. Uh, this is for the networking. Uh, this actually goes back to their phase one PO. So this is completing their work um, for the networking on that portion. And another invoice to be paid to LCN regarding invoice 46490 in the amount of $75,500 dated June 12th, 23, regarding PO 2300325. And this is the phase two networking that LCN is performing. It's been completed. Uh, next one is an invoice paid to NEC regarding invoice 92993832 in the amount of $230, dated May 11th, 2023. This is for the phase two uh, elevator phone from NEC. 
Next one is an invoice paid to UTS regarding invoice 105948 in the amount of $3,068, dated 5-26-2023. That's for soils and concrete testing. And the last two are to W.B. Mason regarding invoice 27950-INV1 in the amount of $341,007.25 on May 30th, 2023 regarding PO 27950. And this is for furnishings from W.B. Mason going back as far as their early PO uh, for phase one. This is getting all of the student furniture in. And so this is one big chunk of their uh, phase one proposal. And a second invoice to W.B. Mason regarding invoice 28061-INV1 in the amount of $59,777.53 dated May 30th, 2023 regarding PO 28061. And again, this is all part of the POs, the larger POs for W.B. Mason for all of the school furnishings, uh, phase one and phase two. Okay, so are there any comments regarding these eight uh, vendor invoices that Michael read into the records? And if not, I'll take a motion to approve um, these eight vendor invoices is read into the record. Uh, Bob McLaughlin will approve of the eight vendor uh, invoices as read into the record. <laughs> uh, second. Okay, all in favor? <clears throat> Emma Thurston? Yes. Don Phelan? Yes. Pat Bruch? Yes. Dave Blazon? Yes. Tom Caputo? Yes. Dave Bowen? Oh, and I. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Yes. Mike McAllister? I am a yes. Amy Zaccarello? Yes. And Bill Avalo? Aye. Okay, next group, All right. Mike. Uh, here is a uh, bucket number two, which has three invoices to be paid. An invoice to Anderson and Krieger regarding invoice 147215 in the amount of $2,849 dated June 16th, 2023. That's ongoing uh, consultation regarding the project changes. An invoice to be paid to CHA regarding invoice number 38840-51 in the amount of $132,000 even on June 2nd, 2023 monthly draw for ROPM. An invoice to be paid to Perkins and Will regarding invoice 200412 in the amount of $103,606.75 dated May 25th, 2023. And that's our monthly draw from our design team. So the, these are three design prof or three professional services. Do we have any comments or questions regarding those as read into the record? Okay. Hey, hearing now. Was that a, a comment? Nope. Bob, no, Bob. Uh, then, yeah. then hearing none, I move approval of the three professional invoices that's read right into the right. Okay, okay all, in all in favor? Emma Thurston? Yes. John Phelan? Yes. Pat Bruch? Yes. Dave Blazon? Yes. Tom Caputo? Yes. Kate Bowen? Oh, and I. Bob McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Joe? Okay. Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zaccarello? Yes. Bill Lavallo, yes. Okay. Uh, and here is the final bucket, bucket number three, which only has two invoices to be paid, an invoice paid to Skanska regarding invoice application number 55 in the amount of 1418, I'm sorry, $1,418,380 even, dated June 1st, 2023. Okay. And the next one, I'm going to go back and, and review these in detail, but I'll let you read them into the record. Yep. An invoice paid to Skanska regarding invoice, uh, sorry, application number 56 in the amount of $807,914 dated June 1st, 2023. So we neglected to spend a little time on this. Uh, Don, are you still there? I'm here. So we have two invoices from Skanska this month. Uh, we break them up into two, right? Maybe you could explain what we're doing here. Yeah, which one do we have here? Okay, yeah. this is the uh, this is the regular requisition. Yes. Uh, for work through May thirty first, this is all activities on the project less the PV work. Um, so the net payable amount, which is what Mike just read in, is one million four eighteen three eighty. And uh, like I said, it's for all work that took place in the month of May, except for the PV panels. So we've separated that out, and this is the other rec. Uh, this that, is the second requisition within the month of May for Skanska. Um, this is 
strictly the PV work. We've separated the accounting. Um, it just keeps things cleaner. This is um, an item that MSBA does not reimburse for. So uh, keeping the accounting separated uh, makes it a lot easier. We've done that with the uh, change orders as well as the billing. So uh, the net payable amount for the PV related work in May is $807,914. Okay, and just uh, stepping back a bit, uh, this contract sum to date, as was read in earlier, two hundred fifty-six million seven hundred forty-five thousand um, total spent to uh, total completed and stored to date is this two forty-seven seven seventy-seven seven seventy-three. We should play the number seven today, and <laughs> that that leaves us uh, about actually ninety-six and a half percent complete on the project overall construction value. So, uh, and actually. <laughs> You know, the interesting thing is with the with the cost reduction that we had today, that number is just going to go up. I think we're going to be 98% by next month. Uh, and so closing in on where we need to be. Any any questions? I'm going to go back. I have, I have any update on, on pursuing any of the grants that are available for solar power? I do have an update. Can I uh, can I make this uh, approval, Bob? And then we could actually. Yeah, I move approval of both Skanska uh, applications. Pat, second. Okay. All in favor, Emma Thurston? Yes. John Phelan? Yes. Pat Bruch? Yes. Dave Blazon? Yes. Tom Caputo? Yes. Yes. Uh, yep, yep. Kate, uh, Joel Moot. Bowen, Joel, uh, Bowen, Kate Bowen, thank you. Yep, Bob Bowen. McLaughlin? Yes. Chris Messer? Yes. Joe DiStefano? Oh, Joe's gone. Okay, Mike McAllister? Yes. Amy Zuccarello? Yes. Bill Lovato, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I've, uh, I'm way far on the right of all these of all these votes on my record. So Bob asked a question, a very good one. Well, you know, what, what are we doing? And by the way, thank you, Michael McAllister, for this. Bob wanted to know how the town, what's the town doing on pursuing some of the grants or the grants? Uh, I, I guess there's also the RECs, you know, for electricity, the uh, alternative energy credits for the geothermal well. So we know that Patrice uh, Garber, town administrator and town finance director, uh, Jennifer Hewitt, have been working uh, together with uh, Dave Blazon. We've had, uh, I think, uh, check-ins with our team. I think, Don, you're working on setting up another one for the AECs. They've retained a consultant uh, for that effort, Bob. Uh, Next Grid, the same consultant that we used for uh, our design review. So that those... Uh, that effort is going forward. Okay, um, I can't report on it, but I know that they've they've got put people in place to help them uh, achieve those goals. The other part was the Inflation Reduction Act uh, grant, and the town has retained a consultant. You know, we worked a little bit on our our project side to sort of get some guidance, but uh, clearly that's something that the town has to pick up. So uh, they they retained a, a consulting firm called Morse. I can't remember exactly. I think they're a legal team that just does grants uh, and, and they know it was impressive. We actually had a meeting with them this week and uh, gave them some information as of yesterday and they're getting started on evaluating and understanding the position that Belmont's in to receive a pretty sizable grant based on this PV installation. So I'm, I'm proud of what uh, Jennifer and Patrice are doing to sort of help the town receive some of those, uh, you know, grants and, and, credits that we talked about for years prior uh, benefiting the town based on what we did on design and the money that we invested in this project. So that's about all I could do. I know Jennifer and Patrice are not on, so I can't go into much de more detail. Bill, does that come back to us or does it go to the, to the general fund of the town? General fund, Bob. Uh, it, you know, those grants that are written are based on the user end, so that's not us, right? So. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there's two two ways to approach the grant, and I'm not an expert in it, but I, uh, one is to look at upfront costs and go after it that way, and the other is to look at uh, your savings and and consider it the, uh, the grant, you know, how much you're saving in, um, uh, how much you're not spending in electricity because of what we're doing. Um, I hear from the professionals that most times people go off the upfront one versus the long term. If you were looking at what you're saving, it actually takes years to uh, pull that information together. So 
Uh, they're going to look at it both ways potentially and make the right decision for Belmont, but uh, it's not coming back to us. We knew we kind of discussed that earlier. I think we knew that quite well. But what we can do to help, I think, is important for the taxpayers. So, uh, any other questions? That's a good one. I have uh, one more section in the agenda to give uh, to Mike Morrison at Skanska, and that's the construction update. So, let me pull it up. Mike, you still there? Yep. Okay. New look for your uh, yeah slide back there. New branding team. Uh, so. There you go. <laughs> The, this outlines some of the work in May that we completed on the phase one side. There was some preparation for work we have to do on that side of the phasing wall this summer. So we did some of that in May, kind of enabling uh, ceilings in the locker rooms, the, the middle school locker rooms that are, that we are currently on our side of the, the phasing scope. So we did ceilings in there. The lockers were delivered uh, to prepare for turnover next September. On the phase two side, a lot of punch list and a lot of commissioning. So as you heard and we'll see, the, the furniture's in, the areas are punch, punch listed. Now it's kind of going, falling back and, and completing the punch list and doing all the mechanical and building envelope commissioning uh, responses. So the, that effort's ongoing and, and we're doing that in May. On the site, oh, the field development was ongoing, curb installation was ongoing, uh, hydro seating, Fencing, fence posts, uh, and sports equipment uh, were all part of the, the work we're doing on the site. So uh, that's pretty much the update for May. And June is kind of what we've been planning for for the past six-plus months uh, in more detail, at least. Uh, so and on outside, I'll stick to outside. The sod was placed in the soccer field. We have sod scheduled for next week for the softball field. Uh, the bleachers were installed. Uh and you'll see that in the update. And we're going to progress towards the, the baseball field, which is right at the entrance to our site. Uh, finish landscaping around some of the non-athletic field areas beyond the curb line was put in place. The fence along the retaining wall, uh, really gearing up to, to wrapping up the site work by you know, end of July. So this is a picture of the D East facade. So the big curtain wall you see on the right is in front of the, the library media center. And that's going to be the main entrance is right below that where the admin suite is. Uh, but this is some of the last piece of uh, exterior of the building we finished up with the metal panel. This is another perspective from, this is between the soccer field and the softball field, looking back at the school. Uh, you see in this picture, the sod rolls kind of on the soccer field and the fence posts are in as well as the trees on the right. Very dark. Oh, here we go. So this is the irrigation obviously working and uh, the sod starting to roll out. Uh, so this field now is completely uh, sodded and we're preparing for sod delivery uh, next week on the softball field. Dave Blazon, you got to get your lawnmowers out. <laughs> another, this is taken from inside the building. Fortunately, we don't take care of those. Oh, okay. Fortunately, it says. One thing I do want to know from this picture, and I know this probably doesn't do it justice, but the, the piles that we've been managing on the project since I think the very enabling phase when we started our site work uh, are all gone. So that's a, that was a huge milestone for us and the team to, to manage the soils to a point where we you know, got rid of all our piles, didn't export any materials. So that was a, that was a big step for us that we, we checked off the list in June. Yeah, just for the team to understand, um, exporting materials from the site is a regulatory issue that would um, start to add up pretty quickly. So the whole idea of changing grades and adjusting was to maintain um, all the regulatory disposal on site so that we didn't have to truck and scan skin did it. It was difficult um, and we paid for it obviously through you know managing, but uh, I think in the end, keeping the soil on site was the goal that we had. And, um, there are no piles anymore. So you drive over by Hinger Street, that's all gone. Job well done. Yep. And that's that was a team effort, not just Absolutely. Scanska, right? Yep. We had you know, working with the design team to figure out how to uh, layer in. I forgot what you said a half inch elevation was, but it was a tremendous amount of soil. Yeah. So we had the last field was the baseball field, and we left flexibility there if we had material that we needed to lose. And for every half inch was 320 yards uh, yeah. just in that field. So so we've been able to 
zero in and, and kind of negate that risk and, and get everything to where we need it elevation wise. So uh, it was definitely a team effort by everyone involved. Uh, here's, here's the bleachers this is the softball field bleachers. Uh, this is new, new install here. Here's a picture of the media center. I think we've seen this in other perspectives. Uh, we kind of took some shots last month from the other side, but this is looking back at the bookshelves and some of the wall mounted shelves. Also known as the library for middle school. <laughs> Here's a pic picture of a science lab yeah. with the, middle, the tables. Middle school science. Correct. Yep. Right. Another middle school science. Yep. So because their walls are covered with uh, millwork, you know, counters and so forth, they don't have the, the whiteboard teaching board. So their boards are on uh, roller frames. Did you see here? More yep. detail. I want to go back to middle school. Science looks fun. So this is a picture of the, the bathroom entryway. So this is in one of the bathrooms, kind of looking across the common space to the other bathroom. Uh, so it's just, you know. The entrance is right around the corner here to the right. All right. Correct. Exit. Yep. Middle school bathrooms. It's just a director's office room. So we sent you a picture of this stair through last month's update. It has since been painted. And in the background here, you can kind of see the, the big non-finished looking wall to the left there where Bill's picture is. So that's, that's the, the, the challenge. That's what we're working on right now as we speak. Uh, but the stair that we're looking at has since been painted. We're, you know, as soon as those walls come down, we're, we're prepped to, to put the finished space back together. So um, the middle school stair, we call this, right? Yep. This is just a picture of our protection. So this is one layer of protection. We have, we call them zip doors, but we have zipper access to this space. And then there's another layer of plastic uh, when you get closer to the stair. So as we progress with this kind of destructive work inside the center of the building, we kind of have a layered system of protection to make sure we're not you know, spreading undue dust or two areas of the building that are done, furniture and cleaned. So this is just, we're working within these areas as we speak um, of protection. So here's the big wows. Yep. Right? So these are the PV panels uh, and some of the ballast material already loaded on the roof. Uh, like we have another picture here of, of more yeah, yeah. just to the skylight. And the last picture. Mostly just, ballast. Yeah, ballast block. We also have, uh, you can kind of see a little bit, but all our guardrail and our temp protection, it's all up there where we're ready to, to get going as soon as we find a resolution. So thank you, Mike. Any questions from committee members? Okay. Um, and so at this point, uh, as I said, we don't have anything to update on the open meeting law complaint uh, agenda item that I had. So I'll open this up to comments then from Belmont residents. See if there's any comments. I see Brian Eiler with his hand up. Good morning, Brian, calling you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. And uh, a couple of things. One is to say that the IRA grant money for the PV is not coming back to the uh, committee is, is not completely accurate. The committee's already received $290,000 um, from uh, the select board as an advance on the on that money. Now, um, Assuming that the additional possible 300 eligible for an IRA debate and uh, rebate. And um, at, if it's rebated at the same percentage, um, we're talking about 77,500 bucks. So uh, there's a possibility or an opportunity to get that money advanced from the select board in the same way that you got the uh, $290,000. So something to keep in mind. Um, the uh, on an unrelated note, um, you approved the meeting minutes from the April twenty eighth meeting. Did these minutes include um, the executive session? No. Did the committee decide not to litigate in that executive session? You, you don't answer that question. No, no I, don't, I don't have any comments. But uh, certainly, the ongoing issues have are potentially ongoing. So. Don't comment on that. 
Brian, there's okay. a separate set, and but just procedurally, there are a separate set of meeting minutes, uh, and they once the issue is resolved, uh, they will become public. Okay, yes, I understand that. Uh, if the committee decided not to litigate, then there's no reason to keep your deliberations secret. And you should tell the public now if that is, in fact, the case. Uh, if there's no litigation, you have no reason to keep the minutes and the recording of the executive session secret either. So uh, we would hope that those would be released to the public at the earliest convenience. Thank you. Uh, so back to uh, what you said, we're talking about two separate funds. But yes, the build building committee did receive grant funding in the amount of $290,000 from the select board that was pulled from uh, ARPA funds, which is federal grant money, but it's not the same as the IRA. So uh, in, in that's Inflation Reduction Act, I should keep saying that. So good point, Brian. Yes, we did receive money. It wasn't from the specific that was asked about the uh, IRA grant. And a very good point you bring up, and I'll add to that. When we were discussing with our, the town's consultant on costs, we asked them, could we add the design costs in on that grant? And they said, absolutely. We said, could we add the changes that we had to make the base building to put this in? And they said, yes. And certainly what Brian's saying is true. The total cost is what they want on the end, and it will include any changes that are layered on. So, and the potential to increase that grant fund uh, grows with, you know, linearly potentially with, with these changes. So good point to bring up, Brian, and thank you. Uh, Lisa, you have your hand up. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question after sitting here. Who on this committee of people, who is the group that are supposed to represent the taxpayers who are supposed to be the liaisons to make sure that all the what's going on with the development and the construction and the finances as we sit here? is looking out to make sure that what's going on on the development side is going okay with the town side that is looking out for this as I sit here and I'm nothing <laughs> I'm just confused about who is looking out for the taxpayers because my understanding of I thought that the school committee the people residents of Belmont not the workers are supposed to be the ones making sure that everything is above board and that the taxpayers literally are not getting screwed. And I don't see that as the case. So I'd like to know who it is on this committee or that come to these meetings that are actually standing up and looking out for the Belmont residents. Well, thank you, Lisa, for your question. I'm, I'm, I think I understand your question. You're saying who represents the town in, in this overall discussion today, and that is it's the yeah Belmont middle and high school building committee it's not a school committee it's the building committee building committee in our town is authorized to uh provide the design and construction oversight to the project and and manage the budget so that's the answer to your question that well, committee right now consists of 16 people um i won't read their names but i did read them during the start of the meeting for roll call and those are the people that are responsible so there's, nobody's really specifically on board just to make sure that the taxpayers are, aren't are getting, you know, taken. Is there anybody, because I'm confused about Mr. McLaughlin's role because I thought he's a Belmont resident, he's on the committee, but yet he seems to be the lawyer for you. Every time something comes up, he tells you, he legally gives you advice. And I don't understand that because I thought we had our own, you know, I mean, I'm, it's getting, it's just a little confusing and I would like it to be straightened out so that I understand correctly who is actually looking out for me and my money and what's going on. And what is Mr. McLaughlin's role as a legal advisor in this situation? So I'll let Bob respond to that, but let me make it clear that the building committee consists of 16 people of which four are Belmont uh, municipal employees whether school or, or, or town, and, and the remaining 12 are Belmont residents, including Bob McLaughlin and myself, taxpayers in and, and this wonderful town. So uh, Bob has a legal Seems background. There's a lot of bias. <laughs> I won't I'm comment on that. I won't let, comment on that. Right, right. Let, let, right. Let, me say, let, let me say of 161 meetings, I've missed three. So I've been in 158 meetings, and I would say, Every member of this committee has in mind the well-being and, and the financial responsibility of the of the taxpayers. Secondly, 
Secondly, the the uh, moderator appoints this committee with a group of uh, various expertise. There's building people, there is uh, legal people, there are financial people. I happen to be one that has a legal background. I am on this committee to the extent to which I can use my legal ability to advance the interests of this. And when something comes up, such as a completely improper inquiry into executive committee function, when the executive committee matters is uh, still uh, to be held in confidence, I instruct uh, or I advise, I don't instruct, I advise the chairman it's an improper question it shouldn't be answered. Well, I find it by sitting here in all these meetings as well that that's not accurate as far as I can see. I haven't seen one person on this committee actually really stand up for the taxpayers. I come to all of these meetings. I've been here before you were because I went before they even started in the town hall. Okay, so I haven't seen anybody. The only two people, maybe you asked some questions, and Mr. Caputo, but no one, it's it, it, like I've said it before, everybody looks a little disturbed and they ask these questions, but everybody approves it. We're in a mess. How can I feel that anybody has looked out for anybody in the town as a taxpayer? Because it's bias. I don't understand how you can be a town representative being on that committee and then turn around and then against a taxpayer, tell Mr. Lavallo not to answer the question. How does that make me feel about the bias that's going on in this committee? Because we're a mess, the whole project's a mess, we're in the hole, more money and money, lies, 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 and you can say whatever you want, you know? But the rest of us who watch, we all have common sense. You don't need much of PhDs behind your name to see the problems that are happening. You just need to attend the meetings and see the things. It's there to see. I'm tired of feeling like you treat us like, you know, you can say whatever you want and we just don't have a choice. And that's exactly what's happened. There's no one on this committee that literally really goes for the taxpayers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in this big mess as it is. And second of all, I don't see how Mr. McLaughlin can sit there and, and be a le legal attribute against the taxpayers when they're trying to, to do it defend themselves and see what's going on because it's so it's been a mess and intransparent the whole time you know you can again say whatever you want think whatever you want you're all on it together it's obvious about that there's a lot of bias and the taxpayers are not getting a fair share shaking it i mean look at that now you want more money for the pvc you got 2.3 or 6 million in the beginning you took that and took it out we gave you a million and another half a million, and now you need another 300. How can you sit there and let me believe? How stupid would I be to believe that you're on budget if we keep giving you millions of dollars to make up for the losses? Plus, we know you took things out. You treat us like we're, you know, like we just ignorant so, and stupid. <laughs> so, Lisa, I want to I want to end on that. Um, it's not yep. a great note, but it, uh, you know, to no, it defend, is, this committee, yes. uh, defend this uh, committee, I think that uh, they put uh, quite a bit of effort in volunteer group with a lot of expertise. And you may, as uh, as a resident, uh, provide your opinion. And I respect that. So uh, and, and and that's the way it's going to end. Um, yeah, well, it's and, too bad. And, so, we're so, getting... and, I, and the, as a chair, right, I have to make sure that comments are are equitable among the people. So I don't give any one person a lot of time, but I do uh, try to get comments in uh, with, a, with a decent amount of time. So I think I've given you a good amount of time to state your, your opinion today as I do almost every month. So uh, thank you. Uh, now I'm gonna turn it back. Oh, Kate Bowen has her hand up. Uh, so committee members, I'm turning it back to the committee and then uh, ask if there's any new business. So Kate, uh, please. Thanks. I just wanted to address one thing. Um, my understanding since town meeting is um, the, the funds that, might, that we may get from uh, alternative energy credits or um, any other kind of grant resources related to capital will flow back into the um, capital debt stabilization fund. I believe, I don't recall the, the numbers of the vote, but that passed the town meeting. So it would not go to free cash, but it would go to that. Uh, but that's right, Kate. Thank you. That was a recent change uh, for town meeting members to, uh, you know, with all, all this work coming up with projects and other resources that are being applied to grants that uh, I, I forget exactly what that's used for. Kate, can you take 30 seconds or 15 seconds just to explain? People are listening. Stay so, so all that would be for the what, what would be in the capital plan projection. Um, yeah. I don't know if Dave Blazin is still on, but 
you know, he he would be uh, aware of that. Was uh, certainly the, the Comprehensive Capital Budget Committee is is uh, publicizing that through the report. Um, yeah. Those going back into go the to, basically. Yeah, yeah, and basically buildings for when you make improvements in buildings, it's going to flow back into taking care of those um, long term assets. Good. Okay. Thank you, Kate, for clarifying. Uh, any other committee comments? And is there anything for new business that committee wants to present? I'm I'm going to remind the building committee that very likely you'll see a request for another meeting coming up within the next uh, couple of weeks, work around the, the holiday, uh, but it is hopefully going to be a, a shorter meeting than the two hours and it's gonna be an important meeting. Um, with that, it'll be before our next business meeting, which is scheduled for July 20th, 8 a.m. And then um, I will work on August. I'll let you know very quickly that August has a few things happening and Pat and I are working on that. Uh, we're turning the building over. We have, we're getting uh, meetings scheduled up with the school committee because they're the ones who accept the building. But first we have to uh, agree that it's ready for transfer as a building committee. So there's a vote required there. There's, some, there's usually a tour ahead of that, that for those of us that are gonna be voting and wanna take a look at it, I'll make those arrangements. Um, so a lot happening in August and certainly then uh, September 6th is our uh, ribbon cutting ceremony at 8 a.m. Uh, that's a Wednesday, and it'll be uh, quite a day for Belmont celebration. So uh, keep, uh, you know, just keep aware that I'll be reaching out to you for this next meeting, which is pretty critical. I don't have anything more. Uh, so at this point, I'll take a motion to end the meeting. And you have a motion to end the meeting, Bob Thank you. Have a second. Bob okay. and second. Thank, thank you. Uh, so, folks, uh, happy summer. I hope you. Enjoy your summer. I'll be reaching out to you soon. This meeting is over. Thank you.